The scale of the problem is huge. We've got till 2050 by the obligations under the Climate Change Act to get our emissions down by 80% from what they are now. And we don't know how to do that in total. When you look at the diagram that shows you where we've got to be by 2050, it, it rather looks like it's one of those diagrams that says, and a miracle happens here. The carbon footprint of the NHS is massive. It's 21 million tonnes of CO2 equivalent in 2007 for the whole of the NHS in England. Will exceed 2 degrees C average temperature rise globally as a result of climate change. The temperature projections show that whatever we do now, we have locked in a rising temperature over the next 20 years or so, and it's going to get worse beyond that if we don't do something fairly radical. The NHS is going to have to operate in a warmer climate in the future and it's going to have to be able to do that whilst reducing its carbon. Now that's going to be a major challenge because it gets really hot on some of the wards at the moment, let alone what that might be like in 10, 20, 30 years time. For a long time there's been very much an emphasis on reconstruction, partly uh, to do with image but also of course the pace at which medical technology and procedures have evolved. But of course the 2008 economic collapse has meant those days are over. We're going to be mostly in the world of refurbishment now and we're going to have to look at how we can make best use of the stock that we've got to make it fit for purpose. The NHS estate comprises something like 30 million square metres, 18 million square metres which is in acute hospitals. It's rumoured to be the biggest estate of buildings under one broad ownership in the world. It's got a stock that ranges from all sorts of ages. Most of it is very old and very difficult to deal with. And around 20% predate the formation of the NHS in 1948. Our project has the ugly acronym DDREC, Design the Delivery of Robust Hospitals in a Changing Climate. It's highly applied we want to get into the nitty gritty of what you might do to particular building types. So our challenge in the project was to understand how we could make hospital buildings more resilient to climate change without simply increasing the resulting CO2 emissions. We select candidate buildings, which we think at least 100 across the NHS estate. We fill them up with sensors, and we've done this for two years, so we get two complete cycles of seasons, and we find out all about how they perform. We measured the internal temperature, and simultaneously we acquired records of the external weather conditions, so that we could understand the relationship between external temperature and external solar radiation and the consequential internal temperatures. And by knowing those two things, we can either calibrate computer models which predict internal temperature. So we build a model of the hospital space, we expose that computer model to the known climate, and hopefully it reproduces the measured internal temperature. And we can tune the model so that it accurately reproduces what we measured. Having done that, then we can use that model to project forward in time as the climate changes to see what would happen with the building as it is now if nothing was changed. And we made projections for 2030, 2050 and 2080. We've had uh, this terrific opportunity because we've had three years and a good funding base to think much more speculatively than the construction industry and designers in practice could ever do. They don't have that luxury. Adam Brooks Hospital was reconstructed on the outskirts of Cambridge from the end of the 1950s. The main inpatient accommodation was built as a 10-storey ward tower above a building containing uh, operating theatres and other ancillary facilities. The building is uninsulated. It's made of precast concrete panels and glass. 
The windows were all replaced in the 1990s as they were across the NHS for safety reasons. The openings were restricted to only 100 millimetres and that's dramatically reduced the ventilation rates achievable. Using our computer models, we discovered that the tower block in a typical year would start to get uncomfortably warm by 2030. But in a hotter year, that tower block is already not meeting the thermal comfort standards of the NHS. So out of the research, we've looked at these five or six principal building types across the NHS, uh, we've diagnosed the data from them, and we've come up with various schemes. Option one pursues the industry standard scheme, that's to say what an enlightened contractor might deliver. This is, in effect, the passive house model, a way of making very low energy houses translated into the world of public buildings. You put a duffel coat around the building, you super insulate it, you seal all the windows and you reduce the area of glazing as it's seen to be the weak link. And then you pump air into it and pump air out through a very efficient heat exchanger. But the net result of that was it pushed the energy demand for heating in winter, cooling in summer and for fan energy to ventilate up to around about 101 gigajoules per 100 cubic metres per year. Now the NHS has a target of between 55 and 65 gigajoules per 100 cubic metres. Options two and three soften the fully sealed passive house approach with conventional heating and the ability to open some of the windows. But option four dispenses with mechanical ventilation systems altogether. It upgrades the external envelope and provides perimeter heating with actuated trickle vents below fully operable occupant controlled windows. Each floor can be cross-ventilated by threading crossover ducts in alternating directions across the width of the floor plate. And there were no predicted hours above the comfort threshold. So this option falls well within the Department of Health energy target. Option five pursues the principle of natural ventilation explored in option four, but reinforces it with stacks to develop greater pressure differences. And the stacks are strictly dedicated to one space per cell. No air passes from one space through another before it leaves the building. The deep stacks on the elevation reduce the glazed area to lessen solar gain, and the depth also shades the glazing through the critical summer overheating period. All the windows can be opened, and the cross ducts of option four are introduced below a fully exposed concrete ceiling. For this option, there were no predicted hours above each of the comfort thresholds, and the annual predicted environmental energy demand, a mere 32 gigajoules. We are producing almost quasi-construction drawings for the adaptation schemes. So you could take one of our schemes off the shelf and pretty much implement it and be fairly confident about the cost. They save a lot of carbon energy, particularly the completely naturally driven ones. So there's everything to play for. If we choose to stick our heads in the sand, then we'll really regret it because it's going to be increasingly difficult to make that transition when we're forced to do it. All of this stock, if we don't recognise how much there is to do and the time it will take to do it, it could suddenly become obsolescent or spectacularly expensive to treat or unusable. None of those are good things. We need to get on with the right thing now. And very sadly, the mortality rate rises very rapidly as the numbers of over hot days start to increase. Refurbishment is more important than ever in making the best use of the money that the National Health Service has got to improve the buildings that it's got, both so that they are more resilient, but also so that they use less energy. If we do sustainable development well within the NHS, we will help improve the health of a population, and we'll actually make savings now that can be used in health services immediately. The big surprise has been how easy it is to win, how to some extent, how little you need to do to buildings to transform their performance, which is, I think, a source of huge optimism.